what kind of influence did David Cole have like on your musical development or anything? Well, David and I worked together at a, like a really early point in my career, but I think what was good about working with David was that he and I got each other in terms of our references, in terms of our points of view. Like certain producers I've worked with, they are either one way or the other. Like Walter is very pop, mm -hmm. you know, um, Puffy has hip-hop references and R&B, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that came at a different point in my life, too, when I could make the decision to work with someone like Puffy. But, I mean, David and I, I sort of snuck that in. Mm -hmm. And I think it was cool because he got me. Like, we really understood each other. And we had a really special relationship. And even, like, a lot of the girls who sang with me on the backgrounds of some of those songs, like, we all really miss him. And we all really feel that loss, you know, because it's like... He um, he was just a very kind of, he was a great musician, but he also had a lot of pop culture sensibility, you know, so. And so, I mean, was it hard after, like you talked about the importance of emotions um, in your career because, you know, you had done the ballad thing, but that was like a huge kind of dance record. It did right. R&B stuff. And, right. Um, you know, so that you really, you had that intense relationship with him, and then for that loss so early, I think when obviously, you know, the stuff you all did in incredible. Anytime you need a friend, just amazing stuff, and there could have been so much there, and then he's gone. You know, does that? Yeah, it was very, it was very hard, um, and it came at a time. It was very unexpected and very hard and very sad, you know, for a lot of us who knew him and who were, you know, touched by him. He was a special person. But um, I think it's it earmarks sort of an important thing in my career that people sort of tend to gloss over. I think when people do like the journalistic job on me, and I'm not including you at all by any means because you're asking me totally different questions than most people do, but some people who do the surface journalism thing or the surface, I'm a critic and this is what I'm supposed to think, mm -hmm. it's like she did ballads and then suddenly she did Butterfly and she became like this hip hop girl. Right. It's like people who didn't really listen to those other albums don't know, you know, or people who don't have, this is what I was trying to explain to somebody today, people who don't have a frame of reference, who don't listen to hip hop radio, who don't go to clubs, right. who don't go to even clubs where they play my house remixes, you know, they listen to maybe alternative music or they listen to rock or classic rock or whatever tapes they happen to be working on, you know, they don't know the subtlety of the fact that Dream Lover was a loop of a you know, a blind alley, which was also a big Daddy Kane record called Ain't No Half Stepping, which in right. turn became Dream Lover, you know, co produced by Dave Hall, who had only done Brand Nubian and Mary J. Blige. Right. So it's like that wasn't like I had suddenly done like the here's the producer who has done, you know, multiple records with um, Whitney or, you know, Madonna or Celine Dion or people that are like known as that type of singer you know what I mean it's like this was something kind of new right. for me to be doing but the pop press would rather focus on oh well she did songs like hero and now she's in a, in a video with mace sitting on mace's lap and it's also I think a black white perception thing and I think that a lot of it has to do with me being visually perceived as white by a lot of people who don't understand about mixed race people right. and that's been a gripe of mine for a long time because i think especially early on i took a lot of heat for people saying well she she's not acknowledging she's black she's saying she, you know she's this she's that and i never didn't acknowledge what i was mm -hmm. i always said look my father is half black half venezuelan my mother's irish people morphed that into black venezuelan because obviously they couldn't fathom yeah african-american and half Venezuelan right. and Irish mm -hmm. and it was like what did you want a sticker on my album cover it's like you know <laughs> by the way in case you're prejudiced right. don't buy her if you don't like X Y or Z well would you at least say that at least um, you know for whatever reason and I mean it, it makes perfect sense in terms of marketing but you know I mean nobody went out of their way I don't think it was really sold and you probably didn't have much to do with this at the very beginning of your career but it mm -hmm. probably wasn't 
I was very upset by certain things that were written in the press, like a, another white girl trying to sound black and things like that. And I, when I had a luncheon at one point for like a lot of R&B press, I addressed those issues with those people. And I mean, it got written about a little bit, but you know, when you're dealing within a corporate structure and you're basically a teenage girl mm -hmm. that is starting out surrounded by a lot of powerful people, you are not at the helm of how you are perceived. And also I think at this point, people are a lot more accepting of me just because I've been here in people's face right. for a lot longer. In the beginning, it was like Vision of Love actually went number one R&B first and then pop. And so it's not like when people say, oh, you went to this R&B direction. Vision of Love was a big R&B record. I mean, people who you would not expect to talk to me about that song, talk to me about that song. Like I, Snoop is in my remix video. He and I had a long discussion about that song. Oh, really? Jay-Z and I had a long discussion. Like people talk to me about how like they remember when that came out and different things about that record. And I forget, you know what I mean? Like, cause I'll be like, oh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll feel like, oh, I don't know. People just bring me down because I do a lot of press where people are like, oh, you made this radical move on Butterfly. I'm like, well, had you really listened, not right. that not that you care to right. listen to the different things in the first album or songs like Sent From Up Above, that was that was much more herb. That could have been a single. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could have been a single, but it wouldn't have probably done very well pop, but it would have been a probably decently you know, a pretty big urban single or songs that didn't even get to my first album because they were told, I was told they were too urban. Right. So, I mean, like, I understand from a marketing point of view, even with artists who don't have this racial ambiguity issue, they often are skewed middle of the road. Right. So, and I, as a songwriter, I'm capable of writing, you know, more mainstream stuff right. or adapting a hip-hop record to be my thing or a house record or right. probably a country song mm -hmm. you know what i mean or even like no one knows but i've written some alternative things that no one knows about <laughs> i mean like i'm just pretty much whatever i'm a musical person right. i grew up with a multitude of influences and i enjoy that as a writer and see the thing about it is is that people know that and people especially back then were like look write us a big ballad where you're singing long notes right. and i know how to do that but that might not be necessarily what's the most stimulating creatively for me, mm -hmm. but I know how to do it. Sometimes it is. Some, I mean, Butterfly, the song Butterfly, to me is very powerful and very um, poignant because it represents a point in my life that was very, very heavily, very laden with drama. Mm -hmm. It was really an intense time.